Honored guests, please welcome President Eric Kaler. Have a seat, guys. Good afternoon. Oh, come on. Good afternoon. There we go. That's better. I'm Eric Kaler, and I'm very pleased that you've joined us to, for today's University Welcome and Fall Convocation. And of course, I want to extend a special welcome to the Case Western Reserve Class of 2028. How's that sound? And a special welcome to our transfer students. Also, we welcome parents and family members in the audience, as well as some of our faculty and staff. Today, we come together to kick off the fall semester in the 2024-25 academic year. To do that, this afternoon, you'll hear from a few members of our leadership team, the president of the undergraduate student government, as well as our terrific keynote speaker, Daisy Hernandez. Welcome to Cleveland. Ms. Hernandez is the author of The Kissing Bug, which was, of course, our common reading selection for this year. She's also the 2024 Elaine G. Hayden Distinguished Visiting Author. And Ms. Hernandez, we look forward to hearing from you a bit later in the program. So to the class of 2028, you are finally here. Yesterday, my wife Karen and I had the chance to meet some of you during the first year move-in. That is always a fun time for us. We enjoy the opportunity to connect with new students and the families, and the move-in is also a terrific experiment about family dynamics. <laughs> you know what I mean. Some people are happy, some people are sad. It's never the same people, and it changes during the course of the day. It's fascinating. But I do hope it was a smooth day for everyone yesterday. Uh, it did pour rain, of course, as you know, and I'll remind you that it's just like at a wedding. If it rains on your wedding day, you have a good, happy, and long marriage, and so it, moved, it rained on your move-in day, so that we take as a good omen. This is your new home. We welcome you, and we celebrate that it's filled with opportunities for you to learn, to innovate, to research, and to engage. And to do so will be a time in which you will be transformed. The knowledge and experience our students accumulate at Case Western Reserve University inspires them to create, to lead, and to innovate in remarkable ways. Our alumni have gone on to become Nobel laureates. One of them created the Nike Air Soul. Another alum invented Gmail. And others have dedicated their careers to civil rights or served as elected leaders in national government. The engineer who developed the first commercially available full-body CAT scan is a graduate. Two of our alumni have been directors of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and thousands of others are working each day in ways great and small to make this world a better place. Now, during Discovery Week ahead of you, we will do our best to help you learn more about everything our campus has to offer. And yes, there is in fact something for everyone. I think you will find this to be a welcoming community. I certainly do. And to the parents and family members here today, you have entrusted us with the care of your student, and that is a responsibility we take very seriously. And the people with me on the platform this afternoon are talented and caring administrators and faculty leaders. They're dedicated to learning and to the overall health and well-being of our students. In fact, one of them in particular should be exceptionally familiar to you. His name is Bob McCullough, and he is our Assistant Vice President for Enrollment and the Dean of Undergraduate Admissions. Without Bob and his excellent team, I think it's safe to say none of us would be here today. So Bob, thank you, and please share a few words. Look at you. <laughs> Chosen from more than 37,000 applications, we welcome 1,575 new first-year students. <laughs> 
from 1,086 high schools representing 86 different countries, 45 United States, Guam, and Puerto Rico, and speaking 63 different languages at home. You are assembled here as a Case Western Reserve Class of 2028 and our new fall transfer students. From the initial point of contact, uh, typically in your sophomore year of high school, my colleagues and I in the admission and financial aid offices have been working with you more than two years to help you find your way here. We've traveled to your hometowns, hosted you here on campus and virtually, and sent heaps of mailings and even more emails. We love getting to read your applications, learning about your hopes and dreams, and we couldn't be more thrilled to see you here today. You come from all around the United States and all around the world. 26% of you attended a high school in the Middle Atlantic states, 7% from New England, 13% from the Midwest, 8% from the South, 6% from the Southwest, 15% from the West, 12% from outside the United States, and 13% from here in Ohio. You've been engaged in your schools and communities. 79% uh, of you volunteered in your community. 63% played a sport. A little over half involved in the arts. 51% uh, of you worked a part-time job or cared for a family member at home. And 20% of you led your classmates as members of student government. 10% of you had a relative who also attended Case Western Reserve, and 13% of you are the first in your family to attend college. As you get to know one another, you may want to know that the most common first name is Alexander. There are 20 of you, and that's pretty great. While 846 of you are the only ones with your first name in the class. This is truly one of my favorite days of the year because it's so full of hope and possibility. When I think about the class of 2028, I reflect on your high school experience. Most of you started high school in the fall of 2020. There was a lot of anxiety, a lot of uncertainty and fear as schools and families tried to figure out how to live and learn through a global pandemic. But you found your bearings, put one foot in front of the other, and now, four years later, here you are starting college with a much brighter outlook. Earlier this summer, my colleagues and I engaged in an exercise that was meant to help our team get to know the university better. We broke up into small groups, and each group was given a fictitious student, perhaps based on some true stories, with information about where they were from, some of the things that they'd done in high school, and a little bit about what they wanted to do in the future. The groups then had to build a four-year plan that would connect the student to resources and opportunities here at Case Western Reserve that would help that student achieve their goals, and then they had to present those plans uh, to the rest of the team. It was truly inspiring to hear the stories of how students would find amazing opportunities like internships and study abroad, research and clinical experiences, interwoven with engagement, in extracurricular activities and various elements of campus life that would help students grow, not, not just in their academic and professional lives, but, but also as humans. I found myself struck by how powerful, powerful these experiences were, but more importantly, how realistic these made up stories were. It's no wonder, we know that 99% of recent graduates participate in experiential learning at Case Western Reserve. And two thirds of our students did at least three different kinds of experiential learning activities. These opportunities are literally right outside your front door with faculty and staff ready and eager to help you find your way. As you embark on this next chapter of your life story, I know that you share in my optimism for all that is in front of you here at Case Western Reserve University. We welcome you to the family and we look forward to joining you in pursuit of your dreams. It is now my honor to present the Case Western Reserve Class of 2028 and new transfer students.
Good afternoon. I am Provost and Executive Vice President Joy Ward. Thank you, Dean McCullough, and thank you to the faculty and staff, student tour guides and orientation leaders, and all of the teachers, friends, and family members who helped bring each of you to this very moment. I enjoyed seeing and meeting so many parents and students during move-in. The weather was not great, but we certainly made the best of it, and I loved seeing all the parents at the reception last evening. As President Kaler mentioned, today you become part of a legacy nearly two centuries in the making. I can assure you that incredible opportunities await, whether in research labs, medical centers, state-of-the-art performance spaces, collaborating on innovative projects, or on our nationally competitive athletic teams. You will find countless ways to succeed. Over the next week, you'll learn about campus traditions and expectations, student activities and organizations, our campus, and the dear city of Cleveland. Most importantly, you'll begin to create community, forge new friendships, and embrace the extraordinary journey you start tonight as a new class on DeSanto Field. To the parents, grandparents, guardians, and other family members here today, as the mother of a college graduate, I understand how truly bittersweet this moment is. You're excited and proud of who your student has become, and you look forward to all that they will achieve. But at the same time, you have already begun to feel the sinking pain of separation, of letting them go, to grow, and to become who they are meant to be. I can speak for the moms. We wouldn't want it any other way, but it still hurts. So I want to leave you with two thoughts. First, we understand how much your young people mean to you, and we are here to support them as educators, as mentors, and as, as counselors. They are now a part of the Case Western Reserve University family, and it is an honor for us to welcome them. Second, we recognize the impact of external events on our world campus. These situations can stir strong emotions, so it's important to engage thoughtfully by listening to understand and approaching discussions with curiosity and respect. We can foster learning and ensure everyone feels valued and heard in this way. Our mission is to guide and support your students as they embark on this new chapter, helping them find their place in this world while honoring their diverse backgrounds. Rest assured, the lessons and values you have instilled in them will continue to guide their journey and beyond. I hope every student here has a great year ahead, and I look forward to meeting each and every one of you in person. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Amon Spencer. Amon is from Gaithersburg, Maryland, and is studying nutritional biochemistry and metabolism in our esteemed School of Medicine. Importantly, he is also your undergraduate student government president. Amon is dedicated to enhancing the undergraduate experience for all students, and with his deep understanding of university life, we are excited to see the impact he will continue to make on our campus, and we thank him. Please join me in welcoming Amon Spencer. Good afternoon, everyone. And to the incoming class of 2028, Welcome to Case Western Reserve University. My name is Aman Spencer, and I'm happy to be serving as the undergraduate student government president for the coming school year. First, I want to take a moment and congratulate you on the achievement of getting into such a prestigious university. The next four years are going to be filled with more opportunities and access than what you could have ever imagined. And I hope you all have taken the time to give yourselves the credit that you deserve. The journey ahead is going to be an amazing one. And I'm confident when I say that you have landed in a great place to spend your undergraduate years. I love Case Western Reserve University, and I will always be thankful for the opportunity to have studied here. 
You see, when I came to college, it was directly in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I hadn't taken an in-person class in almost two years. And it was a little jarring to think about coming to college out of something like that. Arriving at Case Western, I found a community and built friendships that I hope to last a lifetime. The university is surrounded by so much culture and history, and together, the campus and the city of Cleveland truly have so much to offer, truly making this a great place to be. With my time here today, I wanted to give you guys some things to think about. As incoming freshmen, it's no understatement when we say that you are the innovators, and with where you are now, you have the ability to truly make an impact on this world. So with that being said, I have a few things that I want to ask of you guys. First, I ask that when you are deciding on a major or a career path, you think about your dreams not only in terms of what you can achieve for yourself, but also for the impact that you can have on someone else's life. Second, I ask that you uplift your fellow classmates. The undergraduate experience is incredible, but coming to college can be a little bit scary. It's a new environment with new challenges and a new pace that sometimes takes some adjusting. So take the time to uplift one another. Every single one of you will face challenges in these next four years. And with that being said, I ask each of you to be a positive influence on each other the way that you would hope someone to be a positive influence for you. And it's the little things. Ask someone how they're doing. Be that person someone can talk to. Try to understand and not judge. And overall, try your very best to carry yourself with a positive energy that just might make a difference for the person sitting next to you right now. Next, I ask that you dream endlessly. The motto of Case Western Reserve University is to think beyond the possible. Don't allow yourself to be limited by what is or allow anyone to tell you that you are thinking too grandly. Only you know what you are capable of, and I hope that you have that level of confidence in everything that you did. Now, finally, and most importantly, I humbly ask that you do everything you can to enjoy this experience. I truly mean it when I say the undergraduate experience is a once in a lifetime opportunity and that these four years are going to fly by. Sooner than you know it, you'll be standing in, in the position that I am about to start your senior year. And you'll be wondering how you got here so fast. And when you get to this point, the only thing that will matter is whether or not you savored every moment, the good, the bad, and the entire experience as a whole. Now, with that being said, I wish you all the best in the upcoming year, and thank you. Wow. Thank you, Aman. As I mentioned earlier, our keynote speaker, Daisy Hernandez, is also the 2024 Elaine G. Hayden Distinguished Visiting Author. The late Elaine G. Hayden was a beloved member of our community who endowed this annual lecture in 2012. She served as a university trustee for 27 years, and we are profoundly grateful for her service and engagement with the university. And we're especially honored that her daughter and son-in-law, Allie and Joe Hanna, could be with us this afternoon. Welcome. <laughs> Daisy Hernandez is the author of this year's common reading selection, The Kissing Bug. That's the short version of the title. The full title is The Kissing Bug, a true story of a family and insect and a nation's neglect of a deadly disease. Okay. The book was named one of the top 10 nonfiction books of 2021 by Time Magazine and won the Penn Jeanstein Book Award. Ms. Hernandez has also written the award-winning memoir, A Cup of Water Under My Bed. In addition, she was co-editor of the classic feminist anthology, Colonize This, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism. The anthology has been praised by scholars for its contributions to the understanding of intersectionality. As a journalist, she's reported for National Geographic, The Atlantic, The New York Times, and Slate. She's also an associate professor of, creating, of creative writing at Northwestern University. And Ms. Hernandez, we are delighted that you could join us today. Please give us some words.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's such an incredible joy to be here with you today and to be part of your celebration. Students, welcome. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos. This is such an incredible time of change for you. Um, I love actually teaching first year students, particularly in the fall semester, because so much so many profound changes happen for you. So um, I hope that you will keep an open heart to all the changes that unfold for you this semester. The book that I wrote, The Kissing Bug, came about because my own life completely changed the year that I turned five. My family at the time was living in New Jersey in a small town on the Hudson River across from Manhattan. And everyone that I knew was like my father, Cuban American. My mother was part of a minority group. She's from Colombia. Um, and I had a sense as a child that Cuba and Colombia and New Jersey and New York City, these places were all part of the same country. Everyone in this country spoke Spanish, attended Catholic mass on Sundays, and ate a lot of fried pork on weekends as well. That was my homeland, if you will. The year I turned five, though, my mother's sister, Tia Dora, arrived to live with us, and she was actually very, very sick. She was in her late 20s, and she had woken up one day with severe stomach aches. Like many of us, you know, would, in that situation, she thought she ate something that had upset her stomach. So she drank herbal teas, she did some home remedies, and nothing helped. In fact, her abdomen began to swell. It got to the point where she looked like she was pregnant, and she would tell anyone who would listen that she was definitely not pregnant, she was not in any kind of romantic relationship at the time, um, and still her belly actually continued to grow. And then the fevers began. The fevers were horrific. To bring down the fever, my grandmother placed ice cubes on Theodora's forehead, but the ice just completely melted. So our family rushed Theodora to the emergency room where nurses also thought that she was pregnant. They thought she might have an ectopic pregnancy where the pregnancy is happening in the fallopian tubes. But Theodora was not pregnant. She actually had a parasitic disease called Chagas or more formally known as American trypanosomiasis. And for one in three people who are infected with this parasite, it attacks the heart, interfering with the electrical wiring of the organ, and eventually it can lead to heart failure. An infected person can reach the point where they need a defibrillator or even a heart transplant. And the parasite also attacks the GI system, causing the large intestine to basically slow down its movements. So the large intestine will begin to dilate, making it making it even to, so that a cisgender man can look as though he's pregnant. And that's what was happening to my tia Dora. The doctors told our family that she might lose her life within two years. It was a very scary time for our family. Of course, I did not know any of this when I was five years old. All I understood was that my auntie was very, very sick. In New York City that year, she spent months, about two months in the hospital where she underwent multiple abdominal surgeries. And when she came home to us, she needed me in particular. Tia Dora knew some English from studying the language in her home country. Um, when, when the hospital began sending a nurse to our home to check on her, she absolutely relied on me to interpret for her. So this might be a common experience to some of you. I was five years old and suddenly I was talking about a parasitic disease. The nurse needed me to ask some basic questions like, how are you feeling? How much pain? Where is the pain? What are you able to eat? And I ferried back and forth from Spanish to English and so forth. Um, and when I didn't know a word, I brought it with me into the other language. I was not the only child of immigrants in my auntie's life at that time. Her surgeon was himself the son of Jewish immigrants. Dr. Alfred Markowitz understood that my auntie missed eating foods from her home country, that she was not hearing her native language at the hospital. He was incredibly compassionate. And at the hospital, my auntie would sometimes wake up with anxiety or depression, and Dr. Markowitz would always be there saying, it's okay, it's okay. He would tell the nurses, she's without her family, her mother's in another country, it's normal. He used language to affirm Theodora's reality. 
At the age of five then, I began to learn that language can make it possible for someone to receive the medical care they need. Language can create connection and understanding. And language is also fragile. A different doctor might not have understood the cultural dimensions of my auntie's medical situation and might have spoken in a really different way. I learned at that young age that language, in a way, can keep a woman alive. For years, I thought of Chagas as a rare disease, but it actually affects an estimated six million people today. So it is not rare, it is a neglected disease. And again, this is where I began to learn the nuanced powers of language. There's a world of difference between the words rare and the word neglected. Chagas can be neglected because it does not spread between people. It is not like the flu or COVID. You will not catch Chagas from being in a room with someone who has it. It is more akin to Lyme disease, which many of us might be more familiar with. You generally are going to contract the parasite from contact with a triatomine insect known as a kissing bug. And of equal importance, Chagas can be neglected due to the fact that it's a disease primarily affecting people who grew up in poor rural areas of South America, Central America, and Mexico. It is a disease that can be neglected by people with power and privilege and geographical distance, which means by people like us in this room today. My auntie survived that first experience with Chagas disease, and for the next three decades, she spent years going in and out of hospitals. That's because for adults, there is no cure for Chagas disease once it's in that chronic stage, and people are still rarely diagnosed in the acute stage. For this book, I interviewed close to 100 people. This included those who have Chagas disease and their families, and also biologists, cardiologists, infectious disease specialists, entomologists, the list goes on. I found myself completely immersed in the languages of medicine and science. And I should share here that I have a bachelor's degree in English. So I am here to tell you that your English degree can be put to good use. Your parents might be really afraid and nervous <laughs> if you declare an English major, but I, I encourage you to persist. So I, I never imagined when I was studying the American short story in college that I would one day write a book about a zoonotic disease that was first discovered in 1909 in Brazil. And entering the worlds of science and medicine, I learned that the scientific name for this parasite causing Chagas disease is Trypanosoma cruzi, and it is an ancient parasite. One team of international researchers actually looked for the parasite in close to 300 mummies from Peru and Chile. Some of these mummies dated back to the time before Christopher Columbus arrived in the Caribbean. One mummy alone was 9,000 years old. And the researchers discovered the parasite's DNA in these mummies. So the parasite T. cruzi and Chagas disease have been in the Americas for a very, very long time. At this point, some of you are definitely wondering, wait, how do you get this disease? I went to Costa Rica last year. <laughs> Should I be worried? Some of you may already have started Googling. I will share a few details to put your mind at ease. The parasite T. cruzi is transmitted by an insect, as I shared, called the kissing bug. And these insects are actually pretty picky about weather. They don't like places that are too hot, so we don't find them in the Caribbean. They don't like places that are too cold. Don't have to worry in Ohio. Um, these insects like perfect, warm evenings, and they are nocturnal. They come out at night, and you are nothing more than a mammal to them. So they're happy to bite you. They're happy to bite your dog, your cat. And for most of us, when we think about insects and disease, we really think about the bug bite, that that's where the transmission of a virus or parasite happens. But in the case of Chagas disease, the parasite is actually transmitted through the insect's fecal material. I know, before today, most of you had never contemplated the bathroom habits of insects. So welcome to college. You never know what you're gonna learn yet again. <laughs> Charles Darwin came into contact with these insects when he very famously traveled through South America in 1835. And I am here to tell you that not even Darwin himself, who loved the natural world, not even Darwin liked these insects. 
And by the way, there's actually been speculation that Charles Darwin had Chagas disease because of the variety of symptoms that he experienced in his life, particularly GI symptoms. But there's also been speculation that he suffered from something like 40 different diseases. So it's impossible to know what actually happened in his case. But if you do travel to a region where kissing bugs are commonly found, you might get infected only if you generally, only if you are spending nights in rural areas with extensive exposure to the insects. And if you donated blood in the last 20 years, blood donation centers have most likely already tested you for Chagas disease and they will notify you if you turn up positive. So I hope that puts your mind at ease. Because the insects are picky about temperature, they're only found in certain parts of Latin America and also in the United States, in California, the Southwest, Texas, Louisiana, all over the South. And at the same time, the chances that you spent your entire life in the United States and have Chagas disease is very low. The last time I checked, the CDC had not found more than 100 people who had contracted the parasite from insects in the United States. And one reason is that the species of insects here might behave a little differently from those in Latin America. The more significant reason is that the kind of housing we have in the US, even in rural areas, generally affords a very strong barrier to that natural world. Part of what makes diagnosing Chagas disease difficult is that you might simply wake up with a bug bite and nothing more. In some cases, you manage to get the parasitic material into your eye and your eyelid will swell up in a reaction. That can be an indication that you've been infected if you're in an area where the disease is commonly found. But after that acute infection that lasts a few weeks, the parasite can live dormant in the body for as long as three decades before you experience symptoms. As I said, for adults, there is no cure for Chagas disease once it's in the acute stage, but there are two medications that can diminish the parasite load in your body. And for children, it's a very different situation. For children, the medications are actually successful at wiping out the parasite, which is the good news in this situation. So my auntie, Theodora never wanted me to talk about Chagas disease. She knew the power of language. She knew that people had never heard of this disease in the United States. She was also, I think, aware of herself as an immigrant here, and she was afraid of stigma. So I was never supposed to tell anyone that she had Chagas. When she did finally lose her life to this disease in 2010, her coworkers at her funeral thought that she had actually passed from some type of cancer. She worked for, with them for years, but never told them about her illness. And that's part of why I ended up writing this book. I grew up with so much language about this disease, but also with a great deal of silence. And working on this book, I discovered how much power there is both to language and to silence. So I want to give you a writing exercise. I am a writing teacher. <laughs> and when I say a writing exercise, I mean that you can take these questions and use them as a springboard for writing in your journal, for writing a poem, an essay. You can keep it private. You can share it with someone you trust. And the writing exercise is to answer these questions. What part of your family story has never been told? Where in your life today are you silent? And what are you afraid to say? You can actually start writing with that last phrase, I am afraid to say, and make that the beginning of a sentence, the beginning of a line of poetry, and see what comes forth. Give yourself 10 minutes, give yourself 30 minutes. Write by hand if you can, and see what happens for you as you write. What happened for me is that when my auntie died and I looked for a book that could explain this disease to me, I found it did not exist. I could not find the stories of other families and so I went looking for them. I want to tell you about one patient in particular. Her name is Janet and in 2015, Janet was in her 30s. She and her husband had bought their first home in Maryland about 30 minutes outside DC. They had a toddler and Janet was pregnant with her second baby. Her dream was to see her children playing in the front yard of this new home they had bought. She and her husband broke 
grew up in South America in very humble circumstances. So for them, they were reaching this huge dream of having their family and their work and their lives here. However, Janet's second pregnancy was very different from her first. She did not feel the baby moving as often as she had with her first pregnancy. Her prenatal screenings were normal, so she was not sure if anything was wrong. And unfortunately, a lot was wrong. Janet's baby was born early by way of an emergency C-section. He weighed four pounds and had damage to his tiny heart. An echocardiogram showed that his right ventricle, which sends blood to the lungs, was smaller than normal. And the pediatricians found that heart tissue had already essentially died from exposure to the parasite T. cruzi. Janet's son turned out to have congenital Chagas. She herself had no symptoms. In fact, she had been super healthy her entire life. She probably had been infected as a child, actually. Um, and, but she, because she was infected, this, does, this parasite can be passed from mother to child during pregnancy. And that's most likely, uh, that is what happened actually in her case with her son. It did not affect his GI system like it did with my auntie. It went right to his heart. Her son, Luis, turned out to be only the second documented case of congenital Chagas disease in the United States. I underscore the word documented. Obviously, her son was not the second child born with Chagas in this country. We know that because the CDC estimates that anywhere between 63 and more than 300 babies are born every year in the United States with congenital Chagas. We do not know who these babies are. We do not know where they are. That's because we do not screen for congenital Chagas, even though these newborns can be treated with medications and can even be cured. I investigated whether congenital Chagas disease is happening less frequently than other diseases for which we do screen in newborns. And what I found is that congenital Chagas actually occurs in newborns more frequently than 15 other diseases for which we do screen. Again, it's a reminder that this is a neglected disease. I am happy to tell you that Janet's baby was treated and is actually doing very well, which is an incredible relief. I'm going to close by noting that we often use language in a limiting way when we talk about family members who are sick. The illness makes, takes all of our attention to the point that we ourselves obscure other parts of a person's life. My auntie herself was not just this one disease. She had a very full life. She got her teaching credentials in the United States and taught in public schools for many years. She was incredibly stylish. She had a closet full of beautiful dresses. She married a wonderful man. She even wrote an op-ed that was published in our local Latinx newspaper where she argued that it was critical for Latinos to study the Spanish language, especially ones like me who grew up here in the US. My auntie and I also had a difficult relationship. We disagreed about almost everything. She struggled with homophobia and she stopped speaking to me when I came out as bisexual. If she were alive today, we would probably be arguing about the upcoming presidential election. We would surely be arguing about the genocide in Gaza and the U.S. support of Israel. Maybe we would not even be speaking. I do not know. Language is contradictory. It can bring us together and it can tear us apart. It can limit our lives and also expand them. And the silences have just as much power. So I hope that as you go about your first week here, you will ask yourself these questions. Where in your life are you silent? What are you afraid to say? What do you need to say at the very least to yourself? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fernandez. A lot to think about. Now, students, Seeing that this is your first major university event, it's pretty understandable if our alumni are not exactly at the top of mind for you today. 
but you are top of mind for them. The Case Western Reserve University Alumni Association is a highly engaged group of more than 125,000 alumni deeply dedicated to advancing our university and our mission. And so today I'm pleased to welcome the Alumni Association Vice President, Dean Fazekas, who joins us to share a few words. Dean, please. Thank you, President Kaler. On behalf of the Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University, welcome to campus and to our worldwide family of leaders, innovators, and global citizens. We are a dynamic community of 125,000 alumni who are dedicated to this university. We invest in its future and celebrate its accomplishments. We connect to the university and to one another for mutual advancement. Some of you already connected with alumnus before today, at a college fair, on a campus visit, at a reception in your own hometown, or maybe at a recent summer send-off. Others may be recipients of scholarships funded by alumni. Throughout your time on campus, I hope you develop the same pride in Case Western Reserve University as many of us have. While you're a student, we encourage you to engage with alumni. You can work with career services to meet some of us on the job, or you can join us for homecoming at festivities in November or perhaps race alongside alumni in May during the Hudson Relays. And remember that you are always welcome to stop by the Linsalata Alumni Center on Juniper Road. Once again, on behalf of the Alumni Association, I am thrilled to welcome you into the Case Western Reserve family, and we hope to meet as many of you as we can. A time-honored tradition at CWRU is the singing of the alumni of the alumma mater. Now, I have been told it's important in life to know what your strengths are. Many friends and family have reminded me that singing is not one of mine. So I will not attempt to prove them wrong this afternoon. However, please welcome our orientation leaders to lead everyone in the singing of our alma mater. Thank you to our orientation leaders. We appreciate all of your work in helping these students transition to life on our campus. I also want to thank the faculty and staff who had a hand in making our student orientation a success. And students, before we close in just one minute, I have a few bits of advice, and they're pretty simple. There are three of them. 
make smart choices and be safe, stay open-minded and curious, and finally go out and do some important, fun stuff. So that's our show today. At this time, everyone can follow the orientation leaders to the oval in front of Kelvin Smith Library. That's that way. That's where families and students will say their goodbyes. After that, students will stay at the Oval for a barbecue, and families can join a reception in the Tinkhamville University Center. Students, I wish you all great success as you begin your journey at Case Western Reserve University. Once again, welcome.